Hello, and welcome to the B2 IP webinar series, hosted by Bijan Bienemann. Bijan Bienemann is a boutique intellectual property law firm based out of Southeast Michigan. I'm Peter Kiros, and today my colleagues Charlie Bienemann and Chris Francis will be discussing the first in a two-part series on the secret sauce for drafting patent applications. Today's webinar has been approved for CLE credit in several states. In the middle of the presentation, we will announce a polling question that will show up on your screen. If you are seeking CLE credit, please be sure to answer the question before the presentation concludes. On your screen, you will find a Q&A and chat feature. Please leave all questions in either of these boxes, and we will answer them at the end. Thank you, and we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Peter, and thank you all for joining us today. This is Chris Francis speaking, and as Peter mentioned, this is part one of a two-part series that Charlie Bienemann and I are doing. And uh, Charlie and I are going to be, be um, flipping through slides kind of contemporaneously here, um, switching off from slide to slide. So uh, I'm going to go first with the first slide, but Charlie's going to jump in pretty quickly on the second slide. So a couple of introductory comments. Um, the overall theme of this series is to uh, how to prepare and prosecute a patent application in a way that streamlines prosecution while also obtaining the best scope available. In other words, avoiding drawn out prosecution with office action after office action and probably most importantly avoiding those un unnecessary RCEs and their associated fees. So uh, today's presentation mostly focuses on preparation and then next month's presentation is going to focus on prosecution. A few quick comments. Uh, these slides uh, do cover two types of information. Some of the slides are going to focus on best practices, so not necessarily directly tied to any recent development, developments in case law, but nonetheless still rooted in case law and we think very important to the, the good results that we get. And then the other types of slides are going to be focused on case law and, and including some, some case law updates. So with, with that, let's get into the substance. So, so here is an outline of what we're going to be covering, uh, starting with a few quick slides on pre-drafting considerations. So uh, let's start with the inventor interview. So I'm only going to briefly discuss this topic, but um, I think it is worth a few quick minutes because it is a very important step in the process. And I'm always surprised to hear at times that people skip this process. We, as a firm, interview with inventors 100% of our cases that we originate. Um, obviously, some, event, some, some of these inventor interviews are going to be shorter than others if we're familiar with the inventors and or the technology. But in any event, there are a few things that you just have to understand to properly draft a patent application. And some or all of those can be discovered uh, from this inventor interview. So, so first off, starting with the um, understanding the business landscape. So for mechanical and electrical components, this includes um, who supplies to your client and what do they supply, and who and what does your client supply. And then based on prior art and novelty, you're going to be able to combine all this information to, to choose which combinations, sub-combinations, and what statutory classes that you are going to be interested in covering. For, um, for software and method claims, it's important to understand uh, who's performing those various steps and how infringement is detected. So this information is going to be useful for a number of different purposes, probably most notably to avoid divided infringement issues. And then for any type of, of invention, obviously it's useful to know uh, what competitors might uh, want to practice in the future over the next 20 years of the term of this patent. So we make sure our claims cover uh, that type of act activity and can be used to exclude that type of activity. And then uh, moving on to the, the second bullet point regarding the substance, uh, the third bullet point regarding the substance of the invention. So by the time you're done reading the, the invention disclosure and conducting this inventor interview, you really should be the, the most knowledgeable person on this topic, on this invention, with the exception of the inventors. That might sound, again, like common sense, but we get feedback from inventors who say that that's not always the case. And in fact, sometimes they say they're getting critical questions um, at the time they receive the very first draft of the entire patent application. And, and I feel that that's probably in a, a poor use of their time. And it also draws out the entire process, and, and that's detrimental in our first-to-file system. 
Uh, and finally, the, the, the inventor interview is the, is the time to, to pull out all those alternative embodiments, ask those open-ended questions, and get all the information out um, so that we are not doing the inventing, inventing for the inventors. We're pulling all of the inventive concepts out of the inventors um, at this step. Okay, so this is Charlie Bienemann. So now we want to talk a little bit about another pre-filing consideration, which is what happens when somebody sends you the invention disclosure and you look at it and you realize that, uh, hey, what they're really trying to protect, the invention that the inventors have identified to you is uh, really something that's a trade secret. So I'm assuming that pretty much everybody on this webinar knows the basics of trade secrets, trade secret protection, trade secret versus patent. So I'm not going to go into all of that, but I do want to talk about uh, how you might go about drafting a patent application. And again, we're talking about this kind of at the, the pre-filing or pre-drafting stage because these, these are some issues you need to think about really right up front we want to talk about how do you treat those inventions. So the first thing you're going to do probably is think, well, this is a trade secret. Why do we want to patent it? And the answer is that, yeah, a lot of things uh, that are potentially patentable are also uh, maybe currently or potentially maintainable as trade secrets. Software is the classic example. Uh, it may be internal software. It may be you've got an algorithm that you can't really see in the outside world uh, that's really the, uh, really the nut that you want to patent. But nonetheless, the client will say, well, there are business reasons why we want to patent this. We want to have it for defensive use. We want to have it in our portfolio. We may want to uh, cross license or it may be something that we just know we're not going to be able to keep as a trade secret or even though trade secrets are forever, uh, the shelf life of this thing is, is probably less uh, than uh, the patent term we're going to get. Uh, so when we put all those considerations together, it really makes business sense for us to proceed with seeing if we can get patent protection as opposed to trying to maintain trade secret protection. Well, that's all well and good. You do need to ask one question up front before you start drafting anything in that inventor interview that uh, Chris was talking about. And that is, are you willing to disclose enough of your trade secret so that you can meet the written description and enablement requirements that we all draft for? Uh, because if you're not, if you just want to talk about kind of functionality, what the trade secret, uh, you know, what the secret algorithm achieves, that's probably not going to be enough. And if you're not willing to make that quid pro quo of a patent application, then you may want to think twice or you, your client may want to think twice about proceeding with trade secret protection. So let's suppose you're going forward. And again, the reason we put this up front is because that last bullet has kind of some considerations that you ought to have in that initial inventor interview, that initial discussion with your client about, okay, what is it that we think we can claim with this where somebody could detect infringement, uh, where we could uh, provide something that we could enforce against third parties? And the answer is sometimes this can be difficult. Some courts are more liberal in discovery than other courts, and it may turn on you know, what, a, what a judge uh, lets you put in a complaint and then later follow up on. But there are things you can do to try to make your chances better. Uh, for example, you might want to really think about what are the inputs, what are the outputs that I would have to have as part of my uh, algorithm that I, I really want to patent. And maybe I can put those in some claims or put those things in my claims you know, we talk a lot and we'll talk a lot today about functional claiming and avoiding functional claiming, uh, but nonetheless, you might want to talk about functionality because it will signal that, hey, this, this uh, black box algorithm is being practiced. And Chris is going to talk a lot more later about the uses of dependent claims. One use of dependent claims in this situation where you're uh, trying to protect something that may be difficult to detect something that could be eligible for trade secret protection, you may want to think about uh, you know, providing your backup positions, providing your more detectable features uh, that maybe you don't want to burden your independent claims with putting those independent claims. All right, so <clears throat> moving on to uh, claim drafting. So um, following the agenda here, um, we're going to spend a, a, a bit of time on this topic. 
So just jumping right into some some pretty basic principles here. So um, one of the things that makes claim drafting difficult is that we have to draft claims that do three things. We need to get the application allowed by an examiner. We need to cover potentially infringing activity. And then we need to withstand post-grant validity challenges. And, and we have to do all of this without having a crystal ball and, and knowing what a competitor's product might look like 20 years from now and, and knowing what uh, type of hidden prior art uh, is out there that's unknown to us right now. Um, so this, you know, this really, I think, sets up the stage for us to draft the broadest independent claim. And then we can draft to define around the prior art and backup positions in the dependent claim sets for prosecution and or for enforcement. Um, so, you know, the first two bullet points, we'll, we'll be covering some, some topics that hit on those. Um, but I think really the third point is, is kind of at the central theme of the topics that we're going to be hitting on today. So how do we force a very thorough and efficient examination with a good claim set? So forcing the examiner to look through all of our claims, really dig into our invention, and at the first office action, give us a good office action so we at least know their position and better, better know our position as well. So I'm going to pass it off to Charlie for some more general discussion on this topic. Sure. So the first thing you want to think about when you're drafting a claim is what statutory class is the claim going to fall into? You know, 35 U.S.C. 101, Section 101 of the Patent Act lays out what the categories are, the statute statutory categories are that are patentable. You're going to claim one of those. It might not be with exactly one of the words from the statute. You might claim a, a system or an apparatus, but you're, uh, you're going to, or a method, but you're going to claim in one of these statutory classes. There are a lot of considerations that go into that that we're going to be talking about throughout. So the purpose now is just to flag some of them and to flag an issue that we'll again talk a little bit uh, about more. Uh, down the road, and that is that you want to limit yourself to one statutory class. So the classic example is you claim a system, and then in the context of that claim, you claim that the system does some method step. Uh, the iPixel case from, I guess, about 14, 15 years ago now said, well, you can't do that. If you mix system and method elements, then the potential infringer can't tell which one you're claiming, and so the claim's indefinite. Now, there have been subsequent cases. This mastermind case uh, from the Federal Circuit from a few years ago uh, shows kind of uh, you know, how you can get out from under that, where the system claim looked like maybe it was reciting method uh, steps, but the court said, well, it's really just kind of reciting capabilities. So just an issue to be aware of. Pick a class. Stick with that class. Another issue you want to think about in drafting claims, we're going to talk more about this down the road, is uh, divided infringement and the issue of I want to draft my claim in one statutory class against one potential infringer. Um, you also want to think about, okay, how am I going to prove infringement? Who's the direct infringer? Who's the indirect infringer? Think about measures of damages, you know, system claims versus method claims, the proofs of infringement and the measures of damages can be quite different. Typically system claims, device claims are a lot more valuable, uh, but you want to think about that. Typically, like I say at the beginning of the slide, it's kind of self-evident what you want to, what you want to do. As a, a client said to me a long time ago, look, we sell, we sell parts, we sell products, we don't sell methods, so that's what we need to be claiming. But in a lot of cases, maybe you'll have different options. So Chris is going to talk more down the road about uh, the risk of restriction, including between different, different classes and, and how, how you cast a claim in terms of, for example, an apparatus versus a method uh, might also be different uh, in foreign jurisdictions than in the U.S., and you might want to put some hooks in your application to plan for that. So those are things we'll talk about down the road, but all go into kind of this initial consideration of not just what's kind of the fundamental subject matter, but how do I cast it in terms of, you know, is it a process or is it a machine? Is it a article of manufacture. So with that. All right, so moving on to um, some so slides that differentiate between apparatus claims and, and software method claims. So the way we're using apparatus in this presentation 
is uh, the, the traditional mechanical claims, electrical claims, um, something where there's a physical component that you're claiming toward, uh, as opposed to uh, software steps, method steps, that sort of, that sort of information. So um, this is going to be our one slide here on, on considerations for apparatus claims, and then uh, Charlie's going to pick up with software claims in the next slide. So, you know, th this step where we start drafting the claims is, is where we are using all of this information that we gathered in the inventor interview stage. And all of these things are going to guide us on what combinations and sub-combinations are claimed and, and then what steps in the software and, and method claims are going to be claimed. So for mechanical and electrical cases, Claiming combinations, subcombinations, and methods all in one claim set can lead us to a claim restriction. Some clients like claim restrictions. Some clients don't like claim restrictions. It, it, you know, that's kind of a whole other discussion. But in any event, when we want to claim those different classes and different types of claims, some advanced planning can go a long way in, in helping smooth out the process. So let's use an example here. We have three independent claims, a sub-combination claim, a combination claim, and a method claim. As an example, the sub-combination claim is an image sensor. The combination claim is a camera that includes the image sensor, and the method is a method of operating the image sensor. Well, forecasting out a potential restriction, you, you might want to draft your dependent claims with the expectation of electing a sub-combination claim. So, as an example, if you're trying to limit your claims to, to 20 claims or less uh, it, to avoid excess claim fees in the U.S., you might shortchange the, the camera claims and the method claims in this example. Of course, you're going to include a lot of definition in your detailed description so you can build those claims out later. But to save claim space, you might shortchange them in the claim set because the subcombination is often preferred for election because if you get the subcombination claim allowed, you can automatically get the combination and method claims allowed by amending, if necessary to do so, to include all of the elements of the subcombination claim. So in other words, you, you can get the method claim rejoined if you add in the allowable structure to it. You cannot do this in reverse, however, and I have the MPEP sections here as of the last two bullet points. So if you elect the method claim first, you cannot get the apparatus claim rejoined by amending to include method steps. You know, a method step just isn't given patentable weight in, a, in an apparatus claim. And then if you elect the combination claim as opposed to the sub-combination claim, amending the sub-combination claim for rejoinder just to include all the elements of the combination claim would just turn that sub-combination claim into a combination claim itself and would defeat the whole, the whole point of having two separate claims. And then finally, um, we'll be talking about this uh, in a few dedicated slides, but another consideration at this point is the species election requirement. So in other words, picking between multiple embodiments that you have shown in your figures. So staying with this image sensor, an, ex an example of that would be um, two, two embodiments having different chip design. So you know, just a quick point on that, we always want to have our independent claim if possible covering all all embodiments, all species, and then um, also if we can have dependent claims that are generic as well. So you're reducing the risk that you're dedicating to the public or having to file a divisional to cover other claims. So with that, I'll pass it back to Charlie for software discussion. Okay, so there are a lot of considerations that come up for computer cases these days that either aren't present or certainly aren't as significant for, say, mechanical, electrical, uh, or getting into things I don't know much about, chemical cases. So we want to talk about a few of those. I am not going to rehash how to draft for patent eligibility too much, just a little. Uh, we've given prior presentations on that. I've got a link to our webinar on that from about a year ago, and in just looking at that the other day, I think most of the advice and analysis and practice tips we give in there are still uh, pretty applicable uh, a year later. The big thing is you want to draft your claims so that they've got some technical solution in them, so that they present 
uh, a technical feature that's really the key to the invention, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk, into, uh, talk about drafting specifications as well. Um, but again, we've uh, already covered that quite a bit, and I think people are familiar with kind of the general concept there. But there is one point I really wanted to highlight with respect to patent eligibility of computer claims, and that has to do with the guidance that the Patent Office has promulgated, which in general is very helpful. The uh, patentable subject matter eligibility page that the PTO provides has a lot of great resources, including a lot of great uh, charts of, of applicable Federal Circuit and Supreme Court cases. Uh, so it's really worth consulting and can be very useful both in starting to draft uh, claims and, and when you get into prosecution, but you need to take the guidance with a big grain of salt, particularly the guidance that was promulgated just in January of this year that kind of tried to really clarify the ALICE patent eligibility abstract idea test and laid out this notion, probably most people or most people that practice in the area are, are familiar with it, that talked about, well, you need to show that there's some practical application or some uh, integration of uh, a practical application into an abstract idea, and if you can show that, then a claim is patent eligible. Well, there's a recent Federal Circuit case not talking about that January 2019 guidance, but talking about an example that the PTO had promulgated and that a patent owner argued showed, hey, we're just like this example, so our claim is patent eligible. And the Federal Circuit said, well, no, uh, not so fast. We need to actually just apply the law. When we apply the law, you're not patent eligible. They talked about, you know, how much deference do we owe to the administrative agency? There's a case from the 1940s from the Supreme Court called Skidmore that they uh, talked about that probably some folks will be familiar with. Federal Circuit said, well, that's all well and good. We respect the patent office. You know, they're the subject matter experts on patentability, but we're not bound by them and we're not following them. So I really want to flag that when you're drafting claims, and we'll talk more about this next month when we talk about getting into prosecution. You really uh, want to be careful in drafting for the law, not for what the PTO is, is, is currently uh, offering guidance and parameters on. We're going to talk more about uh, functional claiming and how to deal with uh, functional claiming issues. Uh, Chris is going to talk uh, a fair bit about uh, Section 112F, or what some of us older folks uh, know as uh, 112.6, and what happens when you have means plus function language. One thing to be really aware of with computer cases is there's a wide range of terms that can be construed as basically means plus function language. So these so-called nonce words are words that can stand in for uh, means for. So you might think I have to say means for to have 112F invoked. In fact, there's a whole bunch of words that uh, the PTO or the courts have interpreted as a quote unquote nonce terms or as words that invoke 112F. The point in talking about this now is when you're drafting your claims, you want to be really, really conscious that even if you don't intend it, there's a possibility that you will get a 112F construction. You want to be aware of your uh, of, of some very uh, relevant cases, the aristocrat case, which lays out uh, the detail that a specification has to have to support uh, an algorithm that's claimed under 112.6. Uh, if you don't have that detail in your spec, you're going to be indefinite. Uh, the Williamson case uh, talks a little bit about that issue, relies on the aristocrat case, but also talks about the presumption, which isn't as strong as it used to be after Williamson, that you have to explicitly uh, invoke 112.6 in order to get that construction. Williamson made that, that presumption a little weaker, made it a little easier for the Patent Office for courts to find that 112.6 applies. So just be aware of that, and, and it's something you need to think about when you're drafting claims that, in my experience, people often uh, overlook. Also be aware along those lines of having a claim that uh, is a uh, single means claim. As Chris is going to talk about in a moment, 112F talks about uh, functional claiming when you're claiming things in combination. But if you have a claim that says, for example, uh, you know, a computer for, and then you recite a bunch of steps that the computer's programmed to perform or a processor for, there's a chance that will be construed as a, under 112F. You'll only have one means. and 
there's case law out there that says that's going to be indefinite. So just be aware of that pitfall. Uh, we've already talked about the pitfall of mixing uh, system claims and, and method claims together. Uh, you just want to be aware of that. And for functional claiming in general, uh, Dan Hegner did a great webinar uh, not too long ago that we've got a link to that goes into a lot of this in more detail. So there's also uh, a special pitfall that comes up when you're claiming conditional uh, logic in a claim. Uh, and actually, Chris Francis uh, did a whole webinar on this that uh, we don't have the link to in here, so I apologize. But if you email it, uh, email us, we'll, we'll certainly get you that. The basic idea is, and this comes up a lot in computer cases in particular, you're claiming conditional logic. You've got a program. It's got some kind of branch. You know, if I've got condition A, I do thing B. If I've got condition C, I do thing D. Well, there's case law that says, at least in the context of a method claim, that if uh, you've just got A doing B, for example, in prior art, you've met the claim, you've knocked it out. It doesn't matter if the prior art doesn't talk about condition C and doing step D. Now, it may be that you can overcome that just by having a system that has all that logic, that conditional logic programmed into it, uh, but there are also decisions after the Schulhauser case, which was kind of a, a, a key case a couple years ago. There are also decisions suggesting that no, in fact, you're going to run into trouble even in a system claim with that. So sometimes you can't avoid it. Uh, there are times when you can draft your independent claim just to kind of have the main branch, the one branch, and then put the other branch in a de dependent claim. Uh, so think about that when, when Chris is talking more about dependent claims. Sometimes you can try to use words other than if and then, you know, talk about, uh, you know, determining that or upon determining that, uh, you know, X is true, then doing Y, things like that. Um, you know, at the end of the day, though, is sometimes this kind of claiming is unavoidable and you definitely want to be cognizant of the potential issues it can cause. Okay, one more slide on computer claims, and this uh, is covering some ground that we've already talked about briefly. Uh, and I would say that some of this advice is not just true for computer claims, but certainly can be uh, very important considerations when you're drafting you know, mechanical and electrical cases, for example. Um, we talked a little bit about divided infringement before, and I had a link to our, our prior webinar on that in the earlier slide. Um, to my mind, thinking about divided infringement, in other words, how do I target uh, or how do I write a claim so I've only got one infringer, comes up in a computer case where maybe you've got interaction between uh, a client and a server or you know, something in the cloud and a user device, and you want to be sure that when you write your claim that you've targeted the, the smallest uh, piece of the architecture, you know, just the user device or just the server in the cloud, because it might be totally different actors acting totally independently operating those two things. To my mind, that boils down to just thinking about, okay, who is the right direct infringer? Who is the party that I want to be the direct infringer that if I have an enforcement action, I'll be going after? And to my mind, that really starts with just looking at the statute. Look at the statute that defines direct infringement. I think in patent law, often we kind of forget to look at the statute because we're so concerned about what the case law says. But here the statute spells it out pretty well. Think about who that is. As I said earlier, you know, typically you're going to prefer uh, drafting system or device claims to target one direct infringer because the proofs on liability and damages are, and both are going to be better. Uh, sometimes uh, for foreign filing reasons, uh, to provide a little flexibility. I mean, there, there are reasons why you might also want to draft method claims. If you do, or once you pick your statutory class, method claims versus system claims, another consideration is, is that the proofs for direct infringement, divided infringement on both can be a little bit different under the case law. The Akamai case controls method claims currently. The Centillion case controls system claims. Under the Akamai uh, case, it's kind of an agency theory or a, uh, a direction or control theory. Under the Centillion case, it's really who puts the claim system into use. So it may be some other actor does some other step, but you put the system into use. So there's no divided infringement. You're a directed infri direct infringer. Uh, but again, the, the basic analysis is who's the direct infringer I want and then how do I 
draft the claim so I get that direct infringer and I only have to prove uh, acts by that direct infringer. And then if you do have a situation where you might have indirect infringement, you still want to think about, okay, how would I show that other party, that third party's acts? Uh, for example, if I'm drafting method claims that might be practiced by an end user, okay, I'm probably not going to sue an end user. I'm still going to uh, sue the, the OEM or the software vendor. And I want to think about uh, how I would go about proving uh, that indirect infringement. Uh, or you know what intent I would need to see for an, uh, an inducement case. Um, just we don't have time to go into all this here, but the proofs for indirect infringement are different. So you want to think about the issues that um, can arise there. Okay. So Peter, we are uh, setting up to receive the polling for the CLE question. And we'll give, uh, we'll pause here for just a few seconds to give folks a chance to uh, respond, and um, then we'll move on. And I believe I'm correct that we can have folks respond to this at any time throughout the rest of the presentation. Is that right? That is correct. You have until the end of the presentation to submit your answer. <clears throat> All right, so uh, moving on to uh, means plus function claiming. So uh, a few slides ago, Charlie talked about uh, Section 112F and the Williamson case. And to Charlie's point, we want to avoid unintentionally invoking Section 112F by using a nonce word. And so let's just do a little primer here for, for those of us who, who need a refresher on, on 112F. So when 112F is invoked, its effect is that the, the word means in the claim incorporates corresponding structure disclosed in the specification and equivalence. For infringement of a means plus function clause, the accused product must perform the claimed function tied to the word means and must perform that function with the structure disclosed in the specification and any equivalent structure. So you are essentially, essentially limiting your claim to uh, the, the, the structure that you described in your specification. And for this reason, this narrow interpretation, means plus function has largely fallen out of, out of favor over the last few decades. It's just too narrow. And so then the, the Williamson case that Charlie talked about basically said, look, you can't avoid means plus function construction by just using something called a nonce word, some sort of other placeholder instead of the word means. And we'll give you some examples in the next slide, a long list of examples of, of uh, words that have been held to have been nonce words. But um, despite falling out of favor, over the, the recent history, keep in mind that this narrow interpretation of a means plus function clause can actually be used to your advantage. So I encourage you to, to consider in every case whether a means plus function claim can add value. So one example is, let's remain mindful of the post-grant validity challenges that we have now. Um, a, a means plus function claim can be narrowly construed as an example to avoid infringement of an IPR, so to your benefit. And since we get three independent claims to work with before excess claim fees kick in, it's worth considering whether adding that means plus function claim as a third independent claim is a valuable asset to you. So if you are trying to invoke Section 112F, um, well, let's, let's, let's start here. If you're trying to avoid invoking Section 112F, be very careful of these nonce words. Now, if you are trying to invoke Section 112F, you know, your best bet is to use means followed by function in the claim. And then the important detail is you want to include significant detail about that structure in your detailed description. In Williamson, for example, in that court, the, in that case, the court said, well, this is means plus function. However, when we go and look back at your specification, there's not adequate support for that. And so it's indefinite patent invalid, that claim's invalid. And so this next slide is just a, a long list of, of 
um, terms that have been held by courts to be nonce words. Um, I mean, the first one as an example, you have a communication mechanism. So the mechanism is essentially your nonce word. It's, you know, the communication is the function. So there's your means plus function. And the Williamson court basically says you can't avoid, you can't necessarily avoid invoking means plus function by just replacing the word means in this example with the word mechanism. So something to keep in mind. Okay, so moving on to dependent claim strategy. So we've mentioned a few times that um, the dependent claim set is, is very important. It can be a useful tool to, afford, to, to force an examiner to conduct a thorough examination. So if you have a good handle on prior art, my opinion is that the best strategy is to draft claim one for novelty even if you're cutting it very, very close to questions of obviousness, it's just hard to predict how an examiner is going to approach obviousness and what references the examiner might use in an obviousness rejection. So proactively putting limitations in claim one to address 103 concerns just increases your odds that you're going to have an extraneous limitation in that independent claim that you don't need for patentability. It's just not worth, worth trying to guess about it. So so I draft claim one to be very broad. However, that's where our dependent claim set comes into play and becomes very important. So, so first of all, we can, we can forecast possible obviousness rejections and we can bolster our dependent claim set to include elements that would give us a good chance of overcoming any potential obviousness rejections. And another, another thing is we can issue spot words in the ind independent claim that might tempt an examiner to take a very broad interpretation. So if we, if we have a, a term that um, we're concerned about the reasonable interpretation of it, maybe it's going to be an unreasonable interpretation or tempting the examiner, we can put in some more detail in the narrow, in, in, in narrower definitions in the dependent claims as backup positions to, a, to address that. And that way you get that narrower construction. If the examiner does take an unreasonable construction of claim one, you get the narrower construction still examined and considered in your first office action that you get back. And then to finish up this bullet point, I note that, that um, my default is just to limit dependent claims to one element per claim. That way, if a dependent claim is allowed, you, don't, you know you don't have any extraneous details that would unduly limit the claim scope if you just accept that dependent claim and amend claim one, the independent claim to include it. Um, this strategy, I think, also it, it forces me as a practitioner to really think about what elements are important and, and how to layer in the different elements in chains of dependent claims so that you get down to some narrow, um, so, so, some narrow combinations that are still valuable to the client. And then also adding in a single element at a time, it, it's just playing the odds in your favor that you increase and bolster your validity positions while also not missing out on infringement. In other words, if you get a very narrow claim construction or a very narrow claim to survive a validity challenge, it doesn't do you any good if, if you avoid infringement because it's so narrow. And all of this is really just an exercise to force the examiner to give us a thorough examination in that first office action. Since we're forcing the examiner to search and address some of those narrower details of the invention, we have a good idea of the examiner's strengths and their weaknesses by the time we get that very first office action. This increases the likelihood that we get meaningful allowance in dependent claims perhaps, and at very least, uh, hopefully we have issues teed up for appeal without an RCE, and that way our, our client can make a decision pretty early on whether they want to devote the time and resources to appeal a close, uh, uh, arguably, uh, uh, arguable point or whether they want to take allowable subject matter. It, it puts the choice back in our hands and gets all those issues teed up early on. And then finally, an, another point um, to consider with dependent claims is claim differentiation. So this is something that I consider while I'm drafting my dependent claims, but you do have to appreciate that that doctrine is not bulletproof. We have a couple of examples here, and these are both examples that we've blogged on in our, in our blog. Uh, you can find all of our blog uh, articles at the b2ipreport.com. 
Here are just two examples from the last couple of years that touched on claim differentiation. Um, it, it's, it's not a, a bulletproof uh, doctrine, so just keep it in mind. Perhaps it's a, a nice secondary consideration as you're drafting, drafting your dependent claim set. All right, so moving on to the broadest reasonable interpretation. So Charlie and I have a handful of slides to cover on this topic. We'll start here. So these are terms that, that we're calling gotcha terms. So basically the examiner says, hey, I gotcha. I, I might know as an examiner how you're using this term, but the term has a really broad interpretation. It has many broad definitions. And I'm going to use one of those other definitions, and it just happens to uh, track onto prior art as well. So I got you. I'm going to use that other definition. So here are a few more examples that, that are also show up in our blog. So the first example deals with terms that could be, infer could be interpreted as product by process elements and accordingly not given patentable weight. So this case, the In Re Nort case, has some really good citations in it, um, some good citations to Federal Circuit precedent. And, and it, it does note that um, the, the general default for the court is to interpret a limitation that can be either you know, structural or, or process related, if it's kind of uh, could fall in either camp. The default is to, to give the patent applicant the structural definition. So if you find yourself in this position, this is a, a really good case to refer to. Uh, the next case deals with uh, storing at least one piece. And in this particular uh, case, it's storing at least one piece of a computer file. And in this case, the board actually invalidated claim one uh, based on a prior art reference that stored an entire computer file. So it otherwise it included all of the limitations of this claim. Uh, but instead of storing only a part of the computer file, this prior art reference stored the entire computer file. And the Federal Circuit uh, looked at the specification and they identified that actually one of the disclosed embodiments did actually store an entire file. And, and uh, it, the, that's one of the embodiments in the, uh, the, the patent at issue. And so the, the claims did not limit the term, at least one piece, to be anything less than the whole. So the court upheld the PTAB on the interpretation. So appreciate you know that takeaway, looking at this kind of outside the box, at least one oath can actually mean the whole thing if, if not given the right context. And then the, the, the third bullet point here, um, terms like connected, um, you know, coupled, engaged, those types of terms, they, they really need context in the specification. And that context can be very important. I actually had an examiner recently tell me that everything in the vehicle is connected to everything else in the vehicle because connected can include indirect connections. And so literally her example was, well, I can have a tire that's connected to a rear view mirror. There might be 50 parts in between, but they're all indirectly connected you know, amongst each other. And so you know, when you find yourself in, in that position where, in my opinion, that would be an unreasonable interpretation, yeah, you know, this really leaves you with two options. You can, you can, you can fight it. Uh, really, three options. You can fight it and, and appeal it. Um, oftentimes, that's, uh, you know, that's a, a bold point to be arguing on appeal. But the other, more practical options are you can, you can narrow your claim right by amending. But that that could, in some circumstances, carry you know unnecessary prosecution history. Um, or you can reach back into your, you know, the other option is you can reach back into your specification and, and maybe broadly claim um, that your interpretation is correct and support it with text in your specification, uh, contrary to the examiner's interpretation. And then finally, just real quickly at the, the last couple bullet points here, terms like unitary, integral, you know, do those terms mean formed as a single piece, or do they mean uh, two things that are, do they include two things that are formed separately, like, and, and later rejoined together? So an example would be two pieces of metal that are formed separately and then welded together. Are they unitary? Are they integral? Well, that's really where your specification can save the day. You can provide the, the proper definition in your spec and give those claim terms the meaning that you want them to have. All right, and another gotcha term here is at least one of. So does this mean, you know, when, when the term at least one of A and B is used, does it mean A or B? 
or does it mean at least one of A and at least one of B? And that was the issue here in this ex parte appeal case, ex parte young. And um, you know, by way of quick background, this case was actually designated as informative by the PTAB. And then a month later, the PTAB walked that back and de-designated the case and re-listed it as routine. And so without much detail, the PTAB just said, hey, this case is being relabeled as routine because it's not being read as intended. So us as the audience, as the patent practitioners and patent applicants, we were not reading the case properly. But in, in, in any event, I think there, there's a, a really valuable takeaway here and it's just something to have on your mind as you issue spot your claims and the interpretation that you might be getting. So the examiner in this case interpreted the term at least one of A and B to mean A or B, right? And I think that's oftentimes how people mean for their, their, that, that term to be interpreted. But on ex parte appeal, the board actually disagreed with the examiner and instead interpreted the language to mean at least one of A and at least one of B. And in doing so, they cited the super guide case. And what appears to have happened here, I, I think the super guide case perhaps is not read as broadly as it was discussed in the ex parte young case. It brings up the point, though, that that is one possible interpretation. It's not the only interpretation. It obviously, it's based on the text and the context of your specification. But that is a, you know, that's a real possibility that your claim could be interpreted that way. And the last bullet point here are actually some examples that the, the PTAB gave in the ex parte young case for if you want the interpretation of A or B, why don't you just say A or B? or you can use any one of these three points down here as well. At least one of A or at least one of B is, you know, that middle one is probably the, the, the most widely used one or, um, to use there. So just something to keep in mind as, as a broadest reasonable interpretation. Okay, so now we're going to go on and talk about some best practices for drafting specifications. It's no accident that We've spent the majority of our time setting things up, talking about claims, claim drafting, issues that arise with claims, because those, after all, are what legally define the invention, uh, what get interpreted by courts, and um, uh, what you want to be sure are most the most bulletproof thing in your application. The specification is there to support the claims. So we do want to talk about a couple of things that I think will fall out of our discussion of claims that uh, are best practices, important things to keep in mind. The first thing we want to do when we're thinking about the specification is just kind of set up, which is what this slide does, some of the considerations, some of the things you want to have in your head as you start writing the specification. You know, as I said earlier, you always want to go back to the statute. You want to see what the statute requires you to do. In this case, you want to look especially at Section 112A and Section 112B. You want to be sure you've got adequate written description. You want to be sure you've got an enabling description. But beyond that, you want to think about who your audience is, and I should really say who your audiences are. You know, patent document is a curious Thing because it's written for a bunch of different audiences and I would respectfully submit that almost all of those, maybe in some cases all of those, aren't really the skilled artisan that the statute contemplates. So the statute lays out a standard, you know, you may be talking to inventors and, and explaining, well, what we've got to do is we've got to explain things in our specification well enough so that somebody skilled in the art, somebody like you, but just and another company reading the document could practice the invention. And that is uh, you know, a good way to think about it to start, but beyond that, you know, the patent examiner may not be an experienced engineer. Uh, certainly the judge and jury, or the party you're trying to enforce against, uh, their representatives, representatives uh, aren't going to be somebody uh, skilled in the art. So you really want to think when you're drafting the specification, do I have enough in there to explain to the person, not just to the person for whom I'm legally obligated to write, but do I have enough in there to explain to the person that's going to be reading it and interpreting it and enforcing it? Along those lines, another thing you really want to think about, and this follows just right off of the slides that Chris just presented, you really want to control claim interpretation, claim construction. 
So the broadest reasonable interpretation at the PTO is pretty similar to uh, the claim construction uh, standard that is going to be followed in federal courts, and I guess now in some cases uh, at the PTAB. But you want to think about what that plain and ordinary meaning in light of the specification, that being the applicable standard, is going to be, and you want to work to control that. So as you're drafting your specification, you want to think about, you know, think about some of the examples Chris provided, some of the issues Chris provided, what is the broadest reasonable interpretation I could get, or what is the plain and ordinary meaning in light of the specification that a court could ascribe, and then you want to you want to draft to contemplate that. So along those lines, one of our themes, and this may not be how everybody looks at it, but it's how we tend to look at it, you don't want to be afraid of committing yourself. In fact, you do want to commit yourself with respect to key terms to the extent you can do so with an, without unduly narrowing how those terms that you talk about in the specification and then put in your claims may be construed. And the reason for that has to do uh, in large part with the BRI gotchas that uh, Chris discussed. We should have added, we also have a prior webinar on BRI and unfortunately don't have the link to it here, but again, email us and we'd be happy to provide it. And the reason I mention it now is it lists a lot of examples of cases, both you know, ex parte appeals to the PTAB or to the predecessor, the BPAI, or federal court cases where the patent owner applicant either didn't have explicit or clear definitions of terms in a specification and it hurt them, or they did have them and it really helped. And there's just way more cases than you see, slides, uh, than you see cited on this slide. I, I like to give one example of just kind of how this can uh, be important. I think, again, Chris has already given you a bunch of examples. My example is image data. Um, that's something that comes up in a lot of computer cases. You want to define image data so that it rules out a lot of ridiculous constructions or interpretations. Define it as something that, you know, is, is a, a digital image. It's a bunch of pixels. It's a pixel map. It's an electronic, uh, electronically stored image. Uh, you know, this may sound silly, but you want an image defined in a way so somebody doesn't say, well, look, you know, my kid drew something on paper with a crayon and that's an image and I've got prior art that shows that. So. Uh, your claim's invalid, or I'm an examiner and I'm rejecting your claim. So the whole point, again, is if I define an image as just an electronic image, I haven't unreasonably narrowed the term. I'm not going to get broader claim scope than that anyway, and I foreclosed a whole ridiculous uh, avenue of analysis that an examiner or an opposing party might try to throw at you. Along similar lines, think hard about permissive versus uh, restrictive language. As drafters, we're often taught use permissive language, you know, say the widget uh, uh, can be square shaped, it can be conical. Uh, you never say, well, it is conical or it is blue uh, because you don't want to limit your, your potential claim scope. You don't want to restrict things too much. I would say think hard about, look, could the widget ever be any other color? Or does it always have to be blue? Does it always have to be a, a cylinder? If it does, say the widget is cylindrical because there's no other possibility and you're going to make claim construction quicker uh, or claim inter interpretation quicker, more efficient, and you're going to foreclose a lot of, of ridiculous arguments. Um, and there are cases out there that, that bear this out. We've cited one of them uh, here, which is an example worth looking at because I suspect the uh, the uh, a applicant there, or the patent owner there, was burned by prior art that was never contemplated by the drafter to be within the scope of, of the claim term waypoints. So we're thinking about along similar lines, we really like to stress, look, more information is, is better than less. You know, don't hide the ball. There's no point to, to doing that. So when you draft your specification, you want to go back and look and make sure you've got enough detail. Uh, you know, often I'll see specifications that somebody's drafted that will say, you know, I'm going to do uh, X, achieve result X based on, uh, you know, the set of data that includes A, B, and C, and then they don't say more than that. Well, first of all, under Williamson and Aristocrat, you certainly need to. You also need to have the support in case you uh, run, run into a construction that says you've got these 112F nonce words that we've been talking about. 
Um, but also, the more you've got in there, you know, if you've got equations or detailed algorithms, formulas, that's great stuff so that when an examiner says to you or when the other side says to you, hey, you're just waving your hands around and talking in broad functional terms, you can say, no, we've really got a detailed uh, technique here that we disclose in detail in our claims. So, uh, you know, always think about, it goes back to the initial inventor interview, ask your inventors, uh, always think about, can I put into my specification a detailed formula, a detailed equation or set of equations that describe how I do what I do or at least one way of how I do what, what I do. And that really goes to what we say in the last bullet. If you've got kind of functional features, describe how you do them. Don't just say what you do, describe how you do them. And the Williamson and Aristocrat are great examples of that. Uh, there are a bunch of other uh, uh, good examples uh, as well. Uh, one of them we've talked about here, this um, advanced ground case, uh, where I think somebody put a term in, they didn't expect it to be construed under 112F, it was, and then they really had only described it in functional terms in their specification, and they ran into problems. There's a lot of cases like that. You can avoid that by just putting a, a little bit more in your specification that your inventors probably have and, and should be able to give you. So. so this slide is just a real quick setup for Charlie's slides. Uh, that's coming up here. So I'm a strong proponent of including all claim language in the specification. So this allows you to tie the context and definition directly to your claim language. And this can be very important in prosecution and very useful when you're trying to direct an examiner. On the flip side, some are going to argue that keeping claim language out of the spec or even using different terms on purpose that are not in, you know, using different terms in the spec as compared to the claims. Uh, is going to provide some flexibility on enforcement, and and perhaps that is the case. I mean, that you know, you, you might find a situation where that does work out, but it's also going to hinder the clarity that the that the client might have in deciding whether they want to pursue the investment and invest in some sort of litigation and enforcement. So, um, kind of two sides to that coin. But none, nonetheless, if you do include your claim language and your specification, you want to be very careful with that wording to avoid unintentionally narrowing the claim scope by providing some sort of unintentional special definition or disavowing scope of some sort. And that's where Charlie's slide comes into play here with patent profanity. Sure. So I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly because we are drawing to a close in terms of our time. We've already talked about the first point, which is you know, think about explicit definitions, think about non-permissive language. Those are things that I think a lot of us were often taught to avoid, I think, in today's climate, both because there's such a premium on efficient prosecution, we'll talk more about this next month, but also because of, uh, you know, all the proceedings that are going on at the PTAB, uh, there are a lot of benefits to uh, maybe deviating from what historically has been the conventional wisdom and including more explicit definitions and some non-permissive or more restrictive language in your specs. A lot of us, at least in the U.S., in contrast to a lot of other parts of the world, have been taught don't state uh, a problem and, and then the solution to it, don't talk about objects of the invention, uh, really stay away from that approach, and I still wouldn't talk about objects of the invention, but in some cases, uh, and again, uh, the patent eligibility presentation we've done talks about this quite a bit more, where that's a concern, stating a technical problem, stating a technical solution that's the solution that, that has the features in it that you are claiming can be really, really, really valuable. So if you can talk about, hey, we've got this problem and our claims solve it by making a machine work faster, uh, be more efficient, uh, that can really help you. So normally follow the conventional wisdom, at least in the U.S., about problem solution, but really think hard about deviating from it where you may have patent eligibility concerns. And then otherwise, I won't rehash the old rules that I think most of us are, are familiar with. You know, don't uh, start talking about the invention is this, the invention is that. Uh, embodiment is typically a disfavored word, uh, especially in light of the AIA on, on best mode. You can be a little cagey about what the preferred practices or preferred embodiments are. You still want your abstract and summary to do no harm. I think Chris will talk about how you might use a summary of, of claim subject matter uh, on the next slides. But <coughs> um, in general, you, you just kind of want to follow the old rules uh, otherwise. <coughs>
All right, so we are, are running right up against the time schedule, so I'm just going to run through these last two si slides pretty quickly. The most important slide on the drawings is uh, probably that last bullet point. So, you know, as an example, when you're talking to the inventors and you're pulling out all the additional information from that inventor interview, it can be helpful to include some additional figures um, that maybe the inventors didn't give you at the first go around in the first invention disclosure. And perhaps your, your thought is, well, that's going to help me expand my claim scope. And that is a good strategy. Just be mindful that if you do that, you might be inviting a species restriction. And if you get a species restriction and you don't get one of the species rejoined, you only have two options. You can file a divisional to cover the non-elected species or you can dedicate it to the public. And neither of those might be what the examiner, what the client ultimately wants. Um, so always, always limit your, your 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 drawings to what the inventors give you, and and don't be inventing drawings for them to avoid running into that problem. And then finally, drafting for foreign filing. I'll note that very last bullet point. We have an entire presentation from about a year ago about drafting a common spec uh, for USPTO and EPO practice. Um, you know, per perhaps the most uh, important bullet point on this one is um, a comment about multiple dependent claims. So obviously we don't use multiple dependent claims in the U.S. because of cost, but you do want support for those claims in foreign filings for foreign jurisdictions that do allow for multiple dependent claim uh, claiming uh, a little bit more uh, liberally than in the U.S. And so if you're filing your, your U.S. case, uh, your utility as the originating case, you um, probably don't want your multiple dependent claims in there. But if you're filing it, uh, your originating case as a PCT, of course, get those claims in there. And that way you provide uh, uh, support right there in your original filing. Likewise, if you're filing your, your originating case as a U.S. provisional, same thing. You're not going to get those claims examined. You don't pay claim fees. So get the get the multiple dependent claims in there. You can pull them out when you convert to a utility in the U.S. You keep them in when you go abroad. And to the degree that you don't have the multiple dependent claims in your claim set, in the event that you're filing in the U.S. as a utility originating case, just make sure you tie and link all of those combinations together in your specification somewhere so that you have that verbatim support um, in other jurisdictions. And so uh, that, that wraps it up. We will uh, open it up to questions now. Okay, so there's a couple questions about will the slides be available and um, uh, the answer is yes. Unfortunately, they were not available prior to the, uh, we don't make them available prior to the presentation. Uh, and I, it also appears that a few people had trouble with the audio. So we apologize for that. And hopefully, uh, most of you were able to hear the presentation. I don't know what the audio problem, <coughs> excuse me, could have been. So we do have at least one question here. and. Um, as we wait for is to uh, for for more to come in, uh, and that question, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that question is you know we talked about providing detailed definitions to support claim constructions uh, by putting detailed definitions in the specification, but do we ever recommend staying purposefully silent or being uh, short on detail in the specification to allow for broader interpretations to allow for other ways of doing things to allow maybe achieving a result using uh, technology not available at the time of the patent application. Uh, and the answer for that is uh, sort of. The answer for that is that um, we often do um, in our specification, we'll talk about a way of doing something and we'll say, well, here's one way you might do it that's you know, a currently existing uh, technology. Uh, that, that might let you do something, a hypothetical uh, I've used sometimes is, you know, suppose you've got a claim that has, uh, you know, doing something with data and using data on a digital map, 
And there might be different ways to generate the digital map. There might be, uh, you know, you typically you use one kind of data uh, from a particular kind of sensor or a particular setup that you use to then process to generate the digital map. And it may be, though, that uh, that's just kind of incidental because if you could generate the same map, uh, the same set of map data with some other kind of sensor data or, you know, through some other kind of technique or maybe you could get it from the cloud, uh, that would be fine, too, for the purpose of your invention, which just claims doing things with that digital map once you've got it. So the way you'd write your specification is to talk about, I've got this digital map and it can be generated using this technique. Uh, that's, uh, you know, this kind of data and, you know, this kind of algorithm. Uh, but, you know, other algorithms are, are possible or could be developed and you use it and you approach it that way. And this is for things where you're not going to be claiming how you generate the digital map because that is already out there. Uh, you just want to make sure it's fully enabled and, and fully, uh, you've got a full uh, written description on it. So, um, so that, um, that, that's kind of the answer to that question, which is, you know, you may want to leave things open-ended and you can do that, but at the same time, you still want to have kind of a detailed uh, explanation for at least one way you might achieve the, the functionality or the structure uh, that you're claiming. Um, so, all right, it looks like we've gone a little bit over and we don't have any, I don't see any additional questions, is that right? So if there are any additional questions, so I'll turn it over to Peter to close things out. Thank you for joining us for today's B2 IEP webinar. Bijan Bienemann is a boutique intellectual property law firm based out of Southeast Michigan. Today's webinar recording will be posted to our YouTube channel, website, and across all our social media channels. A follow-up email will be sent out shortly with more information on how to obtain CLE credit. Once again, thank you for joining us.